Theropod dinosaurs are notoriously violent animals. Velociraptor, Dinonychus, and the ambassador for all dinosaur kind, T. rex, have gone a long way towards cementing that reputation. But theropods were also extremely diverse, even before becoming the only surviving dinosaur lineage. And wherever we find extreme diversity, there's always a good chance to find weirdness. Of all theropod dinosaurs, Therosinosaurus might be the weirdest yet. In this video, we're looking at why this dinosaur was nicknamed the Tickle Chicken, and we're going to end with some of our own speculations around what the hell was going on with its arms. There are many iterations of Therosinosaurus, and they all begin with a turtle that never existed. Therosinosaurus is notoriously an elusive animal, first discovered in the famous Mongolian hotspot of the Gobi Desert. It was 1948 when Soviet paleontologist Yevgeny Melev found the first fossils. Three partial claws, each over half a meter in length. The genus Therosinosaurus means scythe lizard, which is already a pretty epic description. But after around six years of puzzlement around whom these monstrous appendages belonged to, Malev asserted that they must have come from a five-meter turtle that probably used them to gather seaweed like a billionaire gathering our hard-earned cash. It was given the species name Chiloniformis, meaning turtle-shaped, and it was here that the many faces of Therizinosaurus began. So in the 50s, Therizinosaurus was thought of to have been a Cretaceous sea monster, and it wouldn't have been alone. Turtles were truly epic around 70 million years ago, the time of Therizinosaurus, even more than they are today. Archelon is a good example of this, around the same size as the imaginary Therizinosaurus turtle, weighing over three tons. Visual representations from that era depict Therizinosaurus with a broad, flat body and flipper-like limbs, consistent with Malev's interpretation. These reconstructions illustrate the scientific community's initial attempts to classify these enigmatic fossils. But the reclassification of Therizinosaurus began about 15 years later, in the 1970s, when paleontologists like Anatoly Rozhjastslensky re-examined the claws and suggested that they belonged to a theropod dinosaur rather than a turtle. Quite the change in direction and a new imagining that brought with it depictions that were only slightly less wrong. Rozhjastslensky imagined this animal as a carnosaur, a clade of theropods known for their hyper-predatory and dangerous lifestyles. With no skull or leg bones or really anything other than the scary claws to draw upon, this would have implied one hell of a carnosaur. For example, Allosaurus, the 9.7-meter predator, with the heavy skull laden with dozens of serrated sharp teeth, is a carnosaur, and is not atypical for the group in many ways, so looking at its 30-centimeter long claws may lead an overzealous wanderer to the conclusion that Therizinosaurus was almost three times its size. But Rostyshvensky also suggested that this wasn't a hypercarnivore and perhaps used these long claws in the same way that an anteater or pangolin does, to scrape away earth for feeding on insects. Incidentally, this was shown to be unlikely a while later, when the claws were tested for strength and found to be unsuitable for digging and um, perhaps too brittle even for scraping away at ant hills. And by the 70s, other remarkably similar large-clawed theropods started showing up too. Segnosaurus, identified by some vertebrae, a pelvis, leg bones, and the familiar claws, also came with something that trumped all of these, a lower jawbone. In it, weird, delicate teeth that weren't remotely suitable for tearing large animals to pieces, and would much more likely have been used on slower-moving prey like plants. But while Therizinosaurus was firmly associated with the theropods by the mid-70s, it wouldn't be until the late 70s that the relationship between Segnosaurus and Therizinosaurus would become more apparent. In 1982, a Mongolian scientist, Altangarol Pearl, found some hind limbs from Therizinosaurus, and spotted a distinct similarity between these and those attributed to Segnosaurus. The pieces of the puzzle were coming together. 
Could this huge beast be a pot-bellied, long-necked, plant-eating theropod? Researchers believed so, and grouped this pair of weirdos into their own family along with another outlier called Ehrlichosaurus, whose skull fossils were helping complete the image of this family. So Therizinosaurus had gone from monster turtle lizard to pear-shaped herbivorous giant in just three decades, but there was more to come. Before we take a critical eye to some of the more modern interpretations of this dinosaur, here's a quick reminder that if you've enjoyed this video so far, you can support us a lot by subscribing to our channel. And then if you're feeling very generous, like this video and even pass it around to people who you think might like it too, and we'll be able to keep them coming. And as always, let us know how you feel in the comments. Now, what did Therizinosaurus actually look like? Fossil finds have come a long way to piecing this together in recent decades, but there's still a lot of room for interpretation. Let's start with what we know about its anatomy and then work from there. Between the fragmented remains of Therizinosaurus and those of its close family relations, paleontologists have pieced together a composite image of what this strange theropod might have looked like. First off, it appears to have been around 10 meters long. Not quite at the top in terms of size, but certainly rivaling some of the largest theropods there have ever been. This size comes with a hefty mass of over five tons, and given the monstrosities attached to each arm, it was most certainly bipedal. Its rear legs were sturdy, balanced, and not built for speed, and while there's no skull of this species, fossils of Ehrlichosaurus and Cygnosaurus suggest it had a small, bird-like, narrow head with a powerful toothed beak. A long neck on a teardrop body further confounds imagination and has led to some contemporary images that look remarkably like a giant ground sloth. And this might not be a coincidence. While theropods would have been much lighter for their size than something as beastly as Megatherium, Therizinosaurus in particular may have filled a very similar niche, with a low center of gravity, a long neck, and some incredible grasping claws it could have peacefully spent its days resting on its fat ass and pulling down branches to nibble on. The hints of an enormous gut probably imply that there was a vast fermenting chamber adapted well to breaking down a low-nutrient plant matter diet. And there's one other feature to consider, one of the most revolutionary in recent years to our understandings of dinosaurs. Feathers. Not much is known about feathers in this species in particular. Most interpretations until very recently had gone with the naked approach, which might be a little insulting to what may well have been a big fluffy pear-shaped sloth. But until some imprints are found, it's not clear whether Therizinosaurus had sparse feathering, full shaggy coat feathering, or no feathering at all. However, smaller relatives in this family certainly did have feathers, and this suggests there may be some feathering in its largest known member, but larger animals are also more prone to overheating, so it's no guarantee. Certainly a full coat would be less likely. But it's time to talk about these arms. Each Therizinosaurus forelimb was around two and a half meters in length, and the claws on them are the longest of any land animal known. Inside each claw is a half-meter bony core, and with the sheaths attached, they may have been well over a meter long. But these weren't used in anger, at least not as their primary role. Unlike those upsetting sickle hooks that the infamous killers like Velociraptor used, these were straighter, and the debate over what the hell they were doing there is still one to be had. The most accepted solution currently is one of the reaching, pulling plant eater that we've already described, but given the lack of evidence, it's fun to speculate. And we said we would, so here goes. Speculation one involves an aquatic or semi-aquatic dinosaur with long, heavily feathered fingers that function as nets. This could have been used like the luxurious fans of a porcelain crab to catch small shrimp and fish and bring them to the mouth of the animal. A small nugget of evidence that may hint towards this is the perceived means of locomotion for Therizinosaurus. It appears to have walked on four toes, known as tetradactyly. This rare approach to foot placement has recently emerged in yet another bizarre theropod, Spinosaurus, and the consensus for this species is heading towards a much more aquatic lifestyle 
than was previously thought. Could the extra toe aid in spreading this animal's weight in the soft mud of the shallow water systems it fed in? Most certainly. But being well adapted to mud is not a sure sign of a seafood diet, and a fish eater wouldn't need the extra space for gut fermentation that the hip bones of Therizinosaurus suggest were there. Still, aquatic plants may have been on the menu. Speculation, too, involves a big, fat, winged bird, a bit like an ostrich, whose large wings are used in displays, also for intimidation, and in intricate mating rituals. Their relatively delicate nature may not make them useful as digging tools, but they could allow for a dazzling feathered display, even seen over vast distances. This one's not so easy to debunk, so it may stay in the conversation for a while. It's safe to say that Therizinosaurus didn't fly. It was far too heavy and big for that, and there's no sign of feather attachment points, which is about the strongest argument against wings in general, but if it did have feathers, it would have been one of the largest feathered animals known. And given the range of colors that feathers would allow for, it could have looked all kinds of incredible ways. So the debate continues around the specifics of these incredible arms, and this is part of the fun. Despite their appearance, they were almost certainly not knives, and were more likely closer to salad tongs. But there's still a lot left unsaid about this incredible dinosaur. Recent research from 2014 has strongly suggested a hook-and-pull function, yet precisely what it was hooking and pulling will be more readily understood when some teeth are found. Until then, we'll leave you with one of the more endearing depictions of what started as a giant turtle, then became a slashing murderer and has come all the way through to Cretaceous Super Pigeon, uber cooing to its disinterested mate, in the lovely art of Mark Witten, a paleontologist and artist from the UK. That's all for now. See you next time.